Welcome to the Writing on My Mind podcast. This is where we discuss all things related to the doctoral journey. On this show, I share personal stories and bring some friends along for revealing conversations about their journey and provide inspiration for others to level up as doc students. I'm your host, Dr. Emanuela Stanislaus. I'm a doctorate coach and diversity consultant. I finished my doctorate in four years while working full-time, traveling the world, and balancing a busy social life. And now I'm on a mission to create community for other women of color to complete their doctoral degrees. This is real talk to help you along your doctoral journey. Now let's get to the show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Writing on My Mind podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emanuela Stanislaus, and today I have a special episode. I know that I have shared that I have contributed to a new book, Our Doctoral Journey, a collection of Black women's experiences. The book is out now, and today I'm joined with a few other co-authors. Um, and so I'm going to do a quick run through of their bio, and then we're going to jump right into the conversation because that's where all the goodness and juiciness is. And so I have Dom, short for Dominique, Garrett Scott. Her pronouns are she, her, hers, and she is a big, fine, Black feminist poet, scholar, model, content creator, and self-proclaimed hot girl hailing from Dallas, Texas. She's currently working on her PhD in sociology with a concentration in Black studies and gender and women's studies. And she is currently studying the relationship between anti-Black misogyny, fat phobia, and surveillance. And we have Tabitha Esther, also known as the Body Confident Coach, and she is a fifth year doctoral student at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Her doctoral journey has led her on a personal journey to uncovering who is Tabitha without science. As a woman who dealt with body dysmorphic disorder for 20 plus years, currently she is focused on her passion as a coach where she helps women who are unsatisfied with their bodies and help them develop unshakable body confidence through a personalized body science approach. So welcome to the show, ladies. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for having us. Can I just say, as you were reading the bios, like, shout out to Black women. We showed up and showed out. Each and every one of us are powerful in our own ways. And I'm so excited to be part of this conversation and to share this conversation with you, ladies. Love it. I love the whole, um, yes, you're body confident, but you're a whole self confident. Thank you for all of that confidence that you're uh, pouring over us today. <laughs> And, you know, to your point, we did. We came through on this book. 24 authors came together. Black women came together to help others throughout this, throughout their own journey, right? And so let's talk about how this project came to fruition. I know my story, but who, who wants to share about how this came together? I wouldn't mind going, you know, uh, as part of my chapter, chapter 13, I am in public health. I do research, I do epidemiology research. So a lot of my experience has been focused on large outbreaks. So Zika virus, I worked on um, Ebola. So COVID was also a part of my career. It was actually sort of the, the kryptonite that shut down my dissertation proposal in, in March of 2020. I was actually slated to defend my dissertation proposal March 30th of 2020. But we know the world shut down at like March 15th or March 13th. So I went on a journey of during that period of no progress happening with my dissertation proposal and project. I went on a journey on who was Tabitha without science. And then I also tried to find community. And I started to follow a bunch of Black women PhD pages and just to start to be about a, a part of a virtual community. Because within my doctoral program, I am, I think at the time in March, I was the, I was one out of two Black women. And I didn't really ever have a community in science. I've been in research since the summer of 10th grade. And it's all, I've always been the only one. So 
finding these Instagram pages, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's other women just like me and they're doing bigger things than me. I need to be a part of it. So I started to just put myself in places, uh, be a part of a wonderful network called Cohort Sisters. And I ended up finding Nicole Telfer, who is the lead author on the book. And we started following each other on Instagram and God would have it as I saw her Instagram story where she said, hey, I want to write a book with about 25 or 24 black women PhDs on their doctoral journey, some who have graduated, some who are currently in the journey. So I said, hey, I want to write. Why not? <laughs> and my chapter ended up being really from my journal and through a lot of the, the ups and downs from 2020 and 2021. Um, writing was my therapy to get through that rough moment in my doctoral journey because it didn't make sense. So that's that's how I, I met you guys and what made me here today. And I'm so, so, so happy that, I don't know, I just took a chance on myself and was open to the opportunity. Yes. Uh, we have to shout out Nicole Telfer, who's also been on the podcast before. And yes, she is the connector. I remember we were meeting her for her first book, because uh, she's a three-time <laughs> author, right? And so this is her third book um, with her leading the way um, and bringing us all together. And I want to say the, the first call was, I think she probably thought 12, but she got an overwhelming <laughs> response um, by folks. And, you know, much like yourself, I'm, I'm really excited for our words to be out there in the world and, and that we were able to come together and put all of our um, energies towards this book. So what was the process like for, for each of you? And like, were there any challenges or surprises as you were writing your chapters? Well, I can say for me, the challenge was that my doctoral journey was unfolding as we were writing. You know, I actually initially started to write the essay for my chapter that the chapter is based on for an NIH award. Um, I think it was a rising scientist award. And I was like, OK, I, I, I'm low on funds. I need support. And academia has always been the space where I've gotten income. And so I wrote sort of an essay. It was probably a two pager. It didn't work out. I didn't get the award. I guess God's plan. But I eventually started to, as I continued writing, as I started to be a part of the opportunity, my life kept on happening and kept on changing. I had multiple rounds of brainstorming my new dissertation project. And then in, so we sort of wrapped up at the end of 2021. That was the goal. But then we decided to continue on and submit the final chapter by around March or April of 2022. And during that time period, I didn't have a conclusion. I'm like, how do I end this chapter? What do I write about? And God gave it to me. And I decided to take a one year break from my doctoral program after he kept on putting roadblocks or showing me that, hey, I don't want you to focus on this right now. And initially, because I'm a bit impulsive and I'm, I'm a bit I'm a bit of wild in the spirit a little bit. I told my program, like, deuces, I'm out. Because y'all not understanding I'm going through housing issues. I'm facing eviction. I'm losing my hair. I don't have proper nutrition. Financially, I can't support myself. I'm in a full-time PhD program. And they pay for my tuition and also provide a stipend. But the stipend is about $2,800 a month. And it could not sustain myself and my living after the, the hit of COVID and with inflation. So I'm like, I got to go. I got to figure things out for myself. My, my parents are going through health challenges that I need to be present for. And I actually spoke to a black owned dissertation company called the Dunn Dissertation um, Company who helps people finish their dissertation in like four months or less. I joined the program in January and I was speaking to the director and he said, you know what, Tabitha, you've invested so much time into the program why not take a one year leave? So I think the biggest challenge for me was also the doctoral journey is really an evolving journey because you of yourself are evolving as a person. And so throughout my chapter, you'll be able to see also the evolution of Tabitha Esther and the body confident coach and really building my confidence, even in the academic space to even call the Dean and have a zoom meeting to say, Hey, I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, I had never, I hadn't, I had never been in those spaces before or had to show up in those spaces. Typically, I used to, before becoming the body confident coach, I used to sit in the back of the room. I used to keep my thoughts in my mind. I didn't think my original thought was that special. 
you know, in white academia. But yeah, I think that was the biggest, the biggest challenge of writing this chapter is the unfolding, the evolution of the doctoral journey along with it. Hey, y'all, this is Dom. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest challenges was even just trying to figure out what was it that I even wanted to talk about. You know, similar to to what Tabitha said, this whole situation uh, with me getting my doctorate has been tumultuous would be an understatement. Um, And so there was there was so many stories and experiences that I felt like were unique to me, particularly as a fat black woman that I thought were important to highlight. Um, So I think just like pinning that down and also just trying to be strategic about my time. The the chapter kept getting away from me and I had to sort of have like a moment with myself about uh, priorities and like, you know, like, like this is important. Like, you know, you, you said that you wanted to write this chapter. I know you don't have a lot of free extra time, um, but you know, you're, you, you're in community with these women and like, like your stories are important. Um, so it was also that was 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 like a major challenge. And again, I just want to shout out to Nicole uh, for all of her patience and all of her grace throughout the entire process, because I know it wasn't easy. I know she had to follow up with me. So, yeah, that was a, a challenge that I ran into for sure. You are preaching. You are not the only one. She definitely had to follow up with me too. So God bless Nicole. Yes, I could definitely relate to that with priorities, life, you know, getting in the way, trying to hone in on what do I want to tell? Like, because there's stories, <laughs> there's a lot of stories and also not wanting it to be like trauma porn, right? Because <laughs> there's challenges, of course, but like, we're not just trying to have people be entertained by our trauma, if that makes sense, right? And there are some joys that come along the journey as well. And also real stuff too, Tabitha, you talked about life, where where it's like life is lifing while you're getting your doctorate. Like it does not stop. You get sick. Family members get sick. Births happen. People are you know, dying at the same time, especially too, as we, we're talking about this pandemic that has affected so many of us. So I, I know we're going to jump into some of that as well as as we go through. But, you know, what are you hoping that your chapters and the book overall mean for Black women who are pursuing their doctorates or even, you know, thinking about pursuing their doctorate? I think for me, for my chapter, I am hoping that women stay women and be holistic throughout the entire experience. You know, don't lose yourself. Don't think or feel that all you are or all you're about is your doctoral journey. You are a whole person outside of that. And I think to keep that individually, sorry, that individuality at the forefront because it is what helps you progress through the doctoral journey whatever makes you passionate, whatever lights you up. And of course your doctorate should do that. However, I'm talking about the softer side of you, the passionate aspects of you. And I think a lot of the times as women, no matter what experience we go through, we tend to lose pieces of ourselves. We tend to lose our hair. I've always lost hair throughout the academic experience. We tend to lose our mental sanity. We tend to lose the fun aspect of us, you know, we don't dress up and look cute as much as possible, as much as we typically would, because we are so focused in this sort of material world that we have to produce, produce, produce. And I think one of the key aspects of my chapter is really to remember that you are an individual. Remember to keep that side of you, stay sensual, don't forget your faith, and to know that it is okay to have a pause, take a break, to regroup, to find yourself, and to re-enter as the warrior academic that you are that got you to completing your doctorate in the first place. That was beautiful, Tabitha. I I loved everything that you um, totally shared. Yes, we tend to lose ourselves, and it's important that we 
I guess, I don't know, there's this thing, I don't know if that's even real, but like, you know, it's like Jay-Z did it so that we don't have to, right? So like, we sacrificed ourselves so that other people don't have to, right? Learn from us. And so, Dom, what is it for you that you're hoping that folks uh, get from your chapter in the book overall? Yeah, for my chapter, I really, I think that it's so important. So so one of my favorite sociologists, um, she's a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. Her name is Shannon uh, Malone Gonzalez. And one of the things, and we were when we were in the program together before she graduated, one of the things that she told me, and I tell this to people all the time, I think I'm going to say it for the rest of my life, is that we spend so much time gaslighting ourselves as Black women, um, and we spend so much time not naming the violences that we experience and so as a result they don't get named so they don't get addressed and they don't get taken seriously and we always talked about having just a sister there to tap and be like girl am I crazy and you just need somebody to say no you're not crazy you're not crazy you know what you know your intuition is strong and you're not crazy and these people you know sort of participate in this crazy making process where you're sitting there you're like when they said that was that racist or you know and I think that for me I want my chapter when after people read it I want them to be like see I knew I wasn't crazy I knew I wasn't tripping Um, because I think that there's something like divine and powerful in that affirmation, particularly from other black women that just like, I see you, I see you and you're not alone and you're not by yourself. And I think for my chapter, that's something that I really wanted people to walk away with, especially because I think that, and I'm sure y'all know as, as the black women in your families, I'm sure y'all know what it's like to kind of, I'm not going to say be the star, but I'm sure y'all know what it's like, you know, for, for folks to look up to you and for folks folks to, you know, for for folks to be inspired by you. Um, And they don't know that sort of um, behind the scenes, you know, that you're struggling, you're struggling. And more importantly, that them looking up to you adds to the struggle, that it's like, oh my gosh, I can't even show them that I'm cracking or I'm slipping because I have I have these people depending on me and I'm I'm this example for these people and you know da, 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 da. and I really also wanted to be to be a testament of like how dynamic I am and the fact that I be going through it too that I am not perfect that I am not some beacon of something that I think often gets projected onto me by my friends and family and my loved ones and you know also just like like a moment to be transparent and let people know like you know yeah I I, I fell off the map for a minute and I know that a lot of people didn't know really why I did it and here's why and like writing through it helped me think through it and so I'm hoping that other women who are struggling or or trying to figure out their own mental health disorders um, that they get some sort of just peace and they feel affirmed I love that, Dom. I, you know, I think one of the things that's really stood out to me, what you said, is trusting your intuition throughout the process, whether or not it's through the microaggressions, but also there's a sense of independence of thought and and confidence in your intuition as you are also conducting your research, as you continue on uh, to become this uh, researcher or this doctor who is actually staking a claim in a specific gap in the literature to continue on in your career. And I think one of the things that is so powerful is to trust your intuition because a lot of the times we get in these spaces, especially in white academia, and you know, it's so automatic. Everyone typically comes with the same train of thought or they all flow to the same to the same beat. And you kind of feel a little intimidated where you're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't think of that. You know, I didn't um, have the same thought that everyone had. And it sort of stifles that inner voice. It stifles your own personal intuition, which is probably there because God is leading you to a specific gap or specific place to conduct your research. So I a hundred percent echo that. And I love that you mentioned that because it also will lead you to creating your own specific niche and specific voice in your research and what you are going to come out and publish after you complete your doctorate, which is so important, which they teach you to do or they want you to do in the doctoral program, but it's not fostered. It's not developed. You know, Um, most of the times you go in journal club and they're all like tearing down the methods and, you know, they love to tear down 
other researchers' methods in, in these seminars, but to trust your intuition also with the microaggressions and also with your own original scientific thought is key. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree with everything. And I felt like Dom kind of gave the read for me of the year, which is, you know, that Black women were really good with gaslighting ourselves. And it just made me think of how many times I like something happened and I made an excuse for it. Like, oh, well, maybe I didn't, you know, <laughs> I didn't see it the right way or maybe I was tired or maybe I, I'm making all kinds of excuses when it's really whatever it was, sexism, massage noir, right? Like whatever it was, it's real. And I think too, I don't know who said it. I don't know if it was you, Tabitha or, or Dom, where it's like, we have to tell these stories, otherwise people won't know that we struggled, right? Or that we had an issue, it wasn't easy. A lot of times people see us, right? High achievers or whatever, and they don't think that we struggle. They don't think that there's pain there. And so I think that's what I think this book does. It, it helps folks, it, it helps to demystify the process and to help folks know that even if you make it to these high levels within academia, stuff don't make sense. Like <laughs> the things that we experience doesn't make sense, <laughs> but it makes sense at the same time. I don't know how that, how that goes, but yes, thank you both for, for your answers. I think for me, I'm hoping folks uh, get the importance of community, which this book I think is a beautiful representation of community as coming together. But also I just coming into the doc program, I thought that it was a solo journey, but if it wasn't for my community, whether it was other women of color who were pursuing their doctorate or uh, my spouse <laughs> helping to do, pick up the pieces where I could not pick up or my family, you know, if those things weren't in place, I would not be a doctor today. And so helping folks to understand that community is what gets us to our goals. Uh, that would be my, my takeaway. I, I also just want to say, like, to, to the point that, that we all just made, I think that too often the folks that we see as the higher achievers are the people who we know, who have the PhDs, that, that there, there's a lack of transparency about the difficulty of the process. So you actually don't know how hard the process is until you're in the thick of it. And because folks aren't being transparent about their experiences in the journey, you think, you sit up there and you think that there's something wrong with you. And, 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 I, and I think that that's what happened to me for a long time. I thought it was me. I thought, like, I'm I'm just not cut out for this. I'm just not good enough. I'm just, I don't work hard enough. I'm not smart enough. You know, these sorts of things. And it wasn't until being in community with other Black folks and Black women specifically who were like, girl, I went through a whole this and this and that and that. Or, or girl, I had a baby girl. I left my program and, and my advisor had to convince me to come back. You know, those, those sorts of things. And you know, I think like like being transparent and honest about the messiness of the process, that it can help another person get through, you know, because otherwise I think that if I didn't know about the messiness of some other black women's processes, if they hadn't have been transparent with me and honest with me and, and called me in in that way, I would have been left because I just thought, OK, this just isn't for me. And instead, there's a bigger and because of the fact that we individualize that we don't have a larger conversation about the ways that the ivory tower sucks the life out of us and how that like. And how like like us dehumanizing ourselves becomes normalized, how it becomes like normal for us to lose sleep, how, how we be sitting around. Girl, I was up editing till three o'clock in the morning. I, I barely, you know, and, and we're sitting up here laughing about this. Oh, yeah, I forgot to eat, you know, instead of like recognizing that like we are denied, like graduate school. Sometimes the culture of it forces us to deny our humanity in such a way that when when we and our spirits and our 
bodies sort of push back on that we think it's something wrong with us instead of something wrong with the academy and i think that that's also that transparency is so important um so that folks know again you're not crazy it's not you i agree and i'm so happy that this topic of community came up. I completely agree with you, both you, Dom and Emanuela. So I want to pose the question to you as the listeners are listening and really want an understanding of the transparency of what does your community look like or who is comprised of in your community? A lot of times when we say community, it's it, community can mean different things for different people. And to your point, Dom, about uh, the advisor or the people at your institution not really being transparent um, about the process, I do believe that the community is what is going to push you past those finish lines. That community is what is going to be up with you at 3 a.m. or at least text you to be like, hey, girl, did you finish this part of the aspect? Because I remember when even speaking to my advisor, I love her, Lorna Thorpe. She's an amazing advisor. I call her my academic mother. But I did realize that she is a part of my community, but only up until a certain point where she can understand. You know, she's a white woman, a little older, I feel like. Ooh, don't kill me for saying that, Lorna. Don't kill me. Oh, that was bad. I don't mean, I mean, <laughs> in her career. And I think she has been so far removed from also from the doctoral journey. It's been some time for her that she can only relate up until a certain point. You know, I remember having a conversation with her where I was like, you know, uh, when the pandemic hit and everyone in my doctoral program left the city and they were able to go to their beach houses, their country houses, and they were out of the commotion, out of New York City. And I'm stuck in a low income neighborhood and I'm seeing the public health efforts you know, going to the richer parts of Brooklyn, such as Park Slope. And I'm sitting here like, excuse me, you know, she wasn't able to, and she was like, well, not all of the students, you know, have the opportunity, but she couldn't really relate to me. And I think that's where I started to realize, like, I need other community because I know that she loves me and I know that she has my best interest at heart, but I need another space of community to take me past this next finish line, past this draft. So I want to post to you guys who is comprised in your doctoral journey community. I know, Emanuela, you mentioned your husband, but it's it, it looks differently and it may just be, you know, a mixed bag of people, you know? Your community is really a mixed bag. Totally, yeah. Like I mentioned, my, my husband, and we had to have a, a talk. Like, it was about dividing up the household responsibilities, right? Like I have a hour commute and I'm just coming from classes. Like what does like dinner look like? What does the cleaning cadence look like, right? And also shedding the responsibilities that I was putting on myself as the wife and, and what I have to do. Um, so shedding some of those things and having like hard conversations about it and being okay with the place not being up to my standards in terms of cleanliness, right? Because what's the priority here? The priority is I need to read these chapters or I need to write whatever. Um, and so that was that. My other com uh, community members that I talked about on this podcast too were folks who were not in my program because I didn't always feel like my program was a safe space to have honest conversations. <laughs> my chair wasn't the most supportive. And then some of my classmates, they were just younger than me and in different points of life. Um, and so I created a group of women. We were uh, in all over the country, like Missouri, Texas, uh, Georgia, and we would have monthly chats about what the doctoral process was like for us. And we would share stories, which was just good because you're not just talking to people within your program, you're seeing how there's like consistencies across <laughs> different institutions, right? And so talking about that, sharing resources, finding ways to collaborate, all of those kinds of things, celebrating our wins, that was part of that process too. I also wanted to publish and I didn't have the opportunity to do that within my program. Uh, I shared that I wanted to do that, but the opportunities were only given to white men. And so 
Uh, I shared that with one of my colleagues from my master's program, and she brought me into the fold with her writing group, and we were able to produce some things. And so, like, for me, the, those were, like, my community, if if that makes sense. And then, of course, too, like, folks who don't talk about anything related to your doc program that just help you to just stay connected to who you are and, and that sort of thing. So family, friends, that kind of thing. So those were a few of my community members. Dom? Yeah, I love that. Um, so my mother got her PhD while I was like in school. And so for a long time, um, I saw how difficult that process was for her. And I didn't really fully understand until I was in the program myself. Um, but one thing that she always said was that you got to have people around you who want you to have that degree more than you want you to have that degree. And that for me has been my saving grace because there has been so many times where I was like, forget this program I'm finna go it's people around me that's buying cars they buying houses you know stuff like that and here I am over here scrape trying trying to scrape nickels and dime nickel and diamond knowing good full and well that I'm a researcher an educator a writer you know I, I have all these things I should be making you know and here I am in graduate school making two thousand dollars a month like what and so there were there were many many times that I wanted to leave but I had people in my circle that you know kept me grounded and reminded me why I'm here and also just pushed me like girl please come on now you don't put in this much time go ahead and finish it out and so that was helpful to, to have that sort of community message message. Also for me, I spend a lot of time with people who are not in academia at all. I spend a lot of time around folks who don't even have degrees, who never went to school and those sorts of things because I, well, one, because they're just part of my community. They're just my friends. But also those folks have kept me grounded, right? Because the, the, the academy has its own politics, its own rules and its rhymes and its reasons. And it's really a bubble. And, and it has so many politics that like you wouldn't understand unless you're actually in academia and the, the rules and the politics, they don't make sense. Okay. Okay. They only make sense in academia. But the minute you start talking to somebody else about it, you realize, you know, that do sound wild, don't it? You know, I, I've had people be like, oh, you just spent this much time writing this thing on this article. Oh, I know you're going to have some money coming in. And then it's like, oh, well. <laughs> well, I'm gonna get published. You know, you got folks that are like, oh, well, you just published. Like, matter of fact, you know, I got my homegirls. Oh, you just published a, a book chapter. Okay, money. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I don't quite know about that, you know, and so so there's these politics and these norms to the academy that being around people who aren't in the academy keep me grounded and make sure that I stay critical and sharp about these things. And they also be reminding me about what's important and what's and, and what's not that, you know, this this little mixer that I don't really want to go to and I don't really feel like small talking. And, you know, like I have folks in my life that are like, OK, so, so what you doing for? If you don't want to hang around them professors and, and them people, that are not, then what you going for? Well, because, you know, they know such and such and so and so. No, no, no. You like like you're compromising yourself. That's not the dime I know. You know, and being able to have those people in, in my circle has been so important and so fulfilling. Um, so that's pretty much my girls. That's that's like the, who I call my sister circle. Uh, and then I do have my academic sister circle, my girls that keep me grounded, my, my folks that keep me grounded. So, you know, these are the folks that know the process that that know the process but are are fortunately they're also very critical of it um so for me even though i'm in sociology i spent a whole lot of time with making connections with the folks in the african and african diaspora studies program and that's pretty much like where my my real friends are and so these are folks who i would be folk friends with outside but they also know the game and so having multiple communities that sort of water you in in these different ways, I think it's been so helpful because I can sit with my, you know, my black studies friends and we can co-work and we can, can, can you look over this for me? Can you give me feedback? Like what, what am I missing? You know, I have those folks and then I have the other folks who just feed me as a person. So yeah, my community is definitely multifaceted, multi-layered, and it's because I need it to, because I'm multifaceted and multi-layered. Love it. Love it. Love it. And it just speaks to just how fascinating Black women are, right? Like, we don't have to have 
a community that just looks one way, if that makes sense, right? And, you know, there's duality within us too. Um, we could be professional and we can keep it real at the same time. So love it. So what's next for you all? You're sharing about what you've, you know, gone through as doc students. You're, you've shared it in this book too. Like what's, what's next for you all? What can um, folks expect from you? Ooh, they can expect greatness for me to continue to be a trailblazer in my field. I know that uh, when I told my parents that I was leaving my doctoral program in March, you know, my father was like, you know, when you started research, we didn't even help you. You just took it on and became this trailblazer. So I'm confident enough to know that wherever I land and whatever, after, after this one year break, you know, I truly believe I have never been able to see any like hard science researcher actually tie their personal life and their personal journey within their research. And I think this is the, the, the lane that God is leading me on as a person who graduated undergrad at 267 pounds and went through weight loss surgery and plastic surgery and healed body dysmorphia and then developed my own um, understanding of my body that I'm teaching women. I, I'm so excited to lend that into my research because that's where my passion is. And that's what's going to fuel me to fly through my, uh, my dissertation and graduate. So What's next for me is to continue to cultivate and create my own lane and my own path and not care what the institution or the academy say, says in terms of rules and ramifications. They, they didn't even offer me a one-year leave and they know it was an option. So make decisions for yourself and be true to you. So you'll see me around. It's not the last, the last of me um, for sure. And I'm so excited to help my community. I always wanted for my research to be readily impactful to my community. And now I realize my community really is Black women. I used to work in laboratory and doing laboratory research for breast cancer. And, you know, you're pipetting these cells. And it's like 20 years until you see any sort of impactful change or discovery. And I always had an issue with that because I love people. I love community. I love seeing people win and people thriving, especially health, health-wise. So my, my impact is definitely going to be community-based, and I'm excited about that. One, Tabitha, let me just say, so inspiring. I'm, I'm, I'm just awash in inspiration. I would say for me, what you can expect from me, you can expect... Oh, I hate to still tap with this word, but you can expect greatness. You can expect greatness. You can expect abundance. Um, abundance, I always tell people that abundance is my birthright. And that is, that's what I'm always going for. Here recently, or not recently, COVID really transformed the way that I looked at myself and in the ways that I not only showed up for myself, but the way I told my story to other people. I used to pigeonhole myself as just a graduate student. But with COVID, I guess I kind of, realize that that I'm much more than a graduate student. I'm a writer, I'm an educator, I'm a researcher, and and most importantly, I'm a creative. Too long I let graduate school sort of suppress my my creativity because I'm like, I'm a student, I gotta do this, blah, blah, blah. And so what you can expect from me is beautiful, creative work. I love telling stories. I love telling stories, period. Um, but I'm stepping into my bag as a visual storyteller. Uh, and the bag is deep. The bag is deep. So Y'all can definitely see those things. And also y'all can expect to see a woman who plans on revolutionizing the way that folks think about fat phobia and the ways that people think about how they treat and, and interpret and conceptualize fat black women in their spaces. And yeah, that's who I am. That's who I'm going to be. I love it. Greatness and abundance for us all. <laughs> so, you know, now that you shared the greatness path that you're on, how can people follow you so that, you know, some of that greatness can rub off on them? Uh, share how they can connect with you and follow you, you know, after this episode. You can find me on Instagram doing up these reels and educating you ladies on really deciphering your per personal body signs through your blood type on at I am Tabitha Esther. You will find everything from understanding your blood type to me in lingerie for body confidence to me coming in your DMs and saying, hey, sis we're not supposed to be eating that today or this, this don't work well with your body. So you can find me on Instagram at, at 
I am Tabitha Esther, and also my website, TabithaEsther.com. I do have an Unshakable Body Confidence membership community starting on June 29th, and this is where I'm going to have a group of ladies learning their individual body's love language to a T, from developing your sens- your feminine brand to also making sure that you are managing your weight and understanding what foods work and what don't work for your body. So I love I love y'all DM- DMs, so DM me. I'm always available. I love a good kiki. And hey, y'all, uh, Dom, y'all can find me on everything at Dom the Furious, uh, D-O-M-T-H-E-F-U-I-O-U-S. Um, and it's Dom the Furious because, as James Baldwin said, to be black and relatively conscious in this country is to be in a constant state of rage. Uh, and I am in a constant state of rage. So um, y'all can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I'm on all of those things. I am not just a scholar. I'm an incredibly dynamic woman. Um, so I also create content around um, self-love, self-care, um, and chasing that abundance, chasing that greatness, chasing that bliss and that ease in this life. And so, yeah, follow me. Come come link with me. We vibe on my things. Love it. I will go ahead and make sure that I add all of those links in the show notes so that folks can connect and follow with you and just continue to experience your brilliance. So I will do that. And I am so incredibly grateful for this conversation. Thank you both for being a part of this conversation and for sharing, again, your greatness and your brilliance. Uh, Totally appreciate it. Thank you all so much. And thank you so much, Emanuela, for for creating this space for us and, and for all of your patience and grace throughout this entire process. Yeah, shout out to Emanuela. Hello, Dr. Emanuela here coming to you on the other side of the podcast interview that you just listened to. I hope that you enjoyed the conversation that Tabitha, Dom, and myself had around our new book. As you can tell, writing this book and putting it out into the world was a labor of love and a source of healing for all of us. I hope that you consider buying a copy for yourself or a friend who is considering going to grad school in general. This book is not only for doctoral students, but anyone who is considering pursuing graduate school or even professors and administrators who seek to better understand the experiences of Black women pursuing higher education. The book is available now on Amazon, and there is a link in the show notes for you to go directly to the listing and purchase. So I thank you for listening and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Writing On My Mind podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast, make sure you follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts, rate the show, and leave a comment on Apple Podcasts. You can also donate to the show by clicking the support link in the show notes. Your donations help me to continue to put out new episodes to help support you and other women of color doctoral students. I'd also love it if you could spread the word to other women of color doctoral students to grow our community. Be sure to also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Emanuela. That's D-R-E-M-M-A-N-U-E-L-A. See you on the next episode.